this is my channel, Life in the 1800s Newspaper. Today, I will be reading from the Walla Walla Gazette for December 7th, 1895. It is a story of the 1855 Indian War in Walla Walla, Washington. If you like my channel, you can subscribe by easily clicking in the lower right-hand corner. Thank you. This issue is December 7th, 1895, the 40th anniversary of the Battle of Walla Walla, which was December 7th to December 11th, 1855. The article is entitled, Brave Indian Fighters Celebrate the 40th Anniversary of the Battle of Walla Walla. The fight began December 7, 1855 and lasted four days. It was exciting. Strong, sturdy, and fearless men were those who took part in the four days Indian fight near the mouth of the Tushi. They came up into the country east of the Cascades to subdue it. While the efforts of that single season were not sufficient to accomplish it, the volunteer company inaugurated a campaign which ended in scattering the warlike savages that had inhabited these rich valleys and opened it up to civilization. Emigrants on their way to the Willamette Valley had been molested by the Cayuse Indians. Dr. Whitman and his family had been massacred by them only eight years before, and now they threatened the destruction of any white person who should pass the Walla Walla River. The residents of Western Oregon and Washington determined that the insolent Redskin should be taught a lesson, so they organized for the campaign of 1855. The first blood was shed in Puget Sound, where one atrocious deed of treachery followed another so rapidly that the people had hardly got over the effect of one incident until they were appalled by another. Other tribes of Indians were enlisted until by the time the white settlements were thoroughly aroused to a sense of danger there, there were upwards of 3,000 Indians in the field. General Wool of the Pacific Division of the United States Regular Army, with headquarters at Vancouver, failed to provide sufficient protection for the settlements so that the men of the Northwest Territory, who were able to bear arms, felt called upon to lend their assistance. Governor Isaac I. Stevens issued a call which was quickly responded to, the executive himself taking the field Mason, acting governor, appointed Major J.G. Raines, U.S. Army, Brigadier General of Washington Territory. Governor Curry of Oregon cooperated with the Washington authorities by putting four companies into the field under Colonel Nesmith, an influential citizen of the Willamette Valley. It was one of Colonel Nesmith's companies under Lieutenant Colonel Kelly that advanced from the Dalles, drove the Indians from Fort Walla Walla, and took part in the engagement at the Tushi. Colonel George Hunter, a veteran scout, writes a very entertaining narrative in his reminiscences. Everything concerning this historical event is in demand just at the present time, when the 40th anniversary of the battle is being celebrated. So the Gazette reproduces the narrative in full. When we were first attacked at the mouth of the Tushi, I was out riding a pony that couldn't have outrun a cow, and not wishing to be the hindmost man in the case of a possible retreat, I stopped and changed the pony for my fast mare, which I rode only when I thought a hard or fast ride might be necessary. Lint. Star and Dave White stopped with me, though they were eager to, as a charge had been ordered. It took me but a minute or two to change my rig to the mare. Then forward we dashed and overtook the foremost of the command, which position we maintained. 
Just before we came to the mouth of Dry Creek, we noticed one of our boys, Addington by name, dashing ahead and almost among the Indians. We were satisfied that Addington had lost control of the high-spirited horse he was riding, and if someone didn't do something to get to him quick, he would lose his hair. So we gave rein. My mare was the fleetest, and I thought I never knew her to do better work than she did then, as she bounded over the sagebrush and badger holes to the rescue of Addington. Just as I reached him, an Indian either knocked or punched him off his horse. The Indian gained a horse, but lost a brave. Addington was not lost, for the rest of the command came galloping up as fast as they could. At the mouth of Dry Creek, the Indians made a stand on a high knoll and were setting the grass on fire when some of the boys dashed through the bushes and into their mitts, while others had gone around the knoll thus forcing them to still further retreat, which they continued on to Frenchtown as before stated. Here they had arranged for the final struggle. Ten or twelve hundred Indians were posted in the timber along the river and across the valley to the foothills. Coming up, we saw at once that the retreat had ended and the fight must be in earnest. A point of brush that extended out into the flat some distance, and a fence that a Frenchman had built around a cabin, and a piece of bottom land afforded the only shelter for our men, and behind these they took position as fast as they came up, dismounted and secured their horses. At the mouth of Dry Creek, I came up to Elliot, who was carrying our company flag. He said, Take this flag and carry it to the front. My horse is played out. No sooner said than done. I caught the flag, and in company with Star and White, came up to the point of brush, where sixty or seventy of the boys had already arrived and taken their stands. They were sustaining a heavy fire. I found a short chunk or piece that had been cut off an alder log. This I picked up and carried out a few steps from the point where I threw it down and having driven the spear of the flagstaff into the ground by it, so the rest of the company could see where our men were as they came up. I lay down behind the chunk and kept my head close to the ground, for the bullets were whizzing uncomfortably near me. I had lain there but a few minutes when our captain, Munson, dashed up on a fine black horse that he had succeeded in drawing from the government, and dismounting, he let go of the horse, jerked up the flag, and without looking to see whether there was one or fifty of his men around him, he rushed wildly forward, waving the flag over his head and shouting, Company One, charge! Forward he went on foot, his horse having already gone to the Indians. Not more than seven or eight of his company had yet come up, but those present were not to be outdone by their captain, so they charged with him. Having previously been caught out in open ground by Indians, I didn't relish the movement, and for a moment I played that I hadn't got there yet. But as Star, White, and some of the other boys charged with the captain, I saw that I must face the music, so I charged rather slowly, I admit. When we got thirty or forty yards from the bushes, the Indians raised from behind the sagebrush and other objects that up to this time had been concealing them, and opened fire upon us. About this time, Sergeant Major Miller came up and ordered a retreat. This left our little band in a tight place, but as luck would have it, at that moment, Captain Munson got shot in the arm, causing him to drop the flag and retreat, for he had probably gleaned glory enough for one day. We turned to run. I was, of course, in the lead. But turning around to see who had the flag, I realized that it was being left. And before I had taken the second thought, I had run back, picked up the flag, and then running. Guess I did some of the finest running that a scared man ever did in Walla Walla Valley. Owning to a bad marksmanship or something else, I reached the fence when a rifle ball grazed my temple, barely drawing blood and scaring me so badly that I fell down, got up, and fell down again, 
and finally found myself in the hands of Star and White, who were trying to get my hands from my head and asking if I was badly hurt. I told them I was killed too dead to skin, and from the sight of the few drops of blood and the feeling of my temple, I thought I was. The boys got my hands down, and seeing I was only scratched and not hurt a bit, they made me know I was alive. Our men, seeing the danger in leaving the point of brush, came back and met the Indians hand to hand with knives, pistols, and guns, and taught them to keep a more respectful distance. As soon as I saw that our men had driven the Indians out of the brush, I came too, and helped care for our wounded and dead. There were five or six killed besides me, and twelve or fifteen wounded. Among the killed was my young friend, Lieutenant Burroughs, who fell by my side. I believe he was from Lynn County. About this time, the rest of the command came up with the Indian prisoners and encamped at the cabin before mentioned, the cabin we used for a hospital. We were all convinced that Chief Mox Mox had all the time been planning our destruction, and demonstrations plainly showed that he had ordered this fight and wanted to escape from us. So while the guards were forming camp, they concluded to tie the prisoners. The Nez Pierces proved to be friendly and requested to be tied, but one of the others, Wolfskin by name, jerked out a knife he had concealed and stabbed Sergeant Major Miller in the arm when the others attempted to escape. This settled it, and all the Nez Pierces were killed. There have been several versions of this so-called butchery of prisoners, but I am satisfied the above is correct, and that the boys were justified under the circumstances. But to resume the fight, Colonel Kelly soon came on the grounds, and it was plain that he had a large contract on hand. He posted our men and had rifle pits dug across the flat and to the foot of the hill. During the rest of the first day, we fought from our rifle pits and behind trees and bushes. About a half a mile from our hospital cabin and camp, there was another cabin which the Indians occupied. Along towards evening, the captain of one of the companies brought up the cannon we had taken from Fort Wallula and trained it on this cabin. But after two or three shots were fired, the gun burst, killing or wounding two or three of our men. I believe the captain was one of the number. On the morning of the second day, after we had breakfasted, we found that the Indians had already got into some of our rifle pits and seemed disposed to stay there. But they changed their minds and took a back seat when our boys came up on double quick then guns and revolvers were soon emptied, and so were the pits. Then the scenes and routine of the day before were reenacted with slight diversification. We could drive them but a short distance when they would flank us, and we would have to fall back to our rifle pits and point of brush to protect our camp. We kept 20 or 30 mounted skirmishers on our extreme left to prevent their flanking us, our right being protected by the river and timber. They also kept skirmishes on their right, as their left was on the river. On that afternoon of the second day, I was in timber. There being a large alder tree near me, I climbed some 20 feet up to its fork, which enabled me to overlook the ground occupied by the hostiles. I soon discovered that the Indians had grass on their heads and backs. I told the men that the Indians had grass caps on their heads, and when they saw the grass rise, they should aim just under it. It was but a short time until the grass caps commenced flying. Then the Indians made a rush for the point I was at, and our men, in accordance with orders, started to fall back to the next squad, when someone called out, Stop, boys! Hunter is in the tree yet! But I was not there long, I can assure you, for I stumbled down regardless of limbs or clothing. Suffice it to say, they didn't get me, but I had enough of the tree game. On the third day of the fight, the Indians in front of us would ride up to within one or two hundred yards and fire, then circle away. It appears that two of the boys that we had left at Henrietta 
had gone out to look after the horses when the Indians came upon them, killed and scalped them. And one of these scalps was being shaken at us by the Indians in front of us. Seeing this, I told the boys that if I could get near enough to an Indian, I would take a scalp to get even. During the day, an Indian medicine man would ride close to us, turning, twisting, and shaking a feathered stick or baton, urging the other Indians on to fight. But he came once too often, for I with some others had dismounted, and as he made his last round, the horse and rider both went on to the grass at the crack of our guns. With drawn knife, I rushed for him, as did all the others, both afoot and on horse. But as I stopped to grasp his hair, he gave me his dying look. That settled it. With me, I gave the knife to Nick Belcher, who made short work of lifting his hair. This was the first, last, and only Indian that I ever tempted to scalp. On the evening of the fourth day, the Indians gave it up and left the field in our possession. A day or two after the Battle of Frenchtown, Governor Stevens, with about 20 other white men escorted by about a hundred of the friendly Nez Pierces, came into our camp. The governor, with his party, had been out among the Flathead and Blackfoot Indians making treaties, I believe. He said he thought our fight had saved his party. This assertion he repeated many times in the halls of Congress, while trying to secure a remuneration for us.